I want to sort of introduce Shalin. Shalin, but uh, uh, he is uh, currently now doing his own startup specifically around sort of numbers, metrics, and sort of building tools around it. But before also that, I've known Shalin for a while. He was the head of growth at Zomato. Uh, he was at Zomato for all the way through till there to the IPO. Uh, he's one of those really smart people because Zomato has got a phenomenal user data access, right? And, and Zomato, if you want to look at it from a D2C perspective, they literally drive traffic to their own website. So the amount of data or experiments that they're able to conduct and their learnings are sort of invaluable for all, all of us sort of you know, take from. More than that, I don't even need to mention, uh, but Shal is one of the really smartest people. I mean, I obviously interact with a lot of experts, but he, he, among true, you know, fundamental first principle thinking people would be Shalin. I mean, he has a background. Before that, I was matrix partner as a VC. Uh, and before that, uh, obviously from an educational background, he's from uh, IIM Ahmedabad and IIT Kharagpur. Uh, so I hope, uh, and we've done this at a very interesting case uh, and I don't want to take more time. So Shalin, uh, welcome to expert. And if you can give a round of applause and, uh, stage is yours thanks thanks so much sharad and thanks guys for having me it's always been a pleasure engaging with you uh, sharad for for our expert cohorts Ex excited to be the new cohort as well so thanks for being here guys awesome awesome so i think we can get started uh, i i believe sharad did broadly share the agenda for you, but just to sort of uh, understand how we'll be breaking that down uh, we'll spend about. Actually, you want to increase your mic or mic a little closer, so it'll be easier. okay. Let me just bring my mic a little closer. Is this better? Yeah, yeah much better. Awesome. So, uh, uh, Sharad would have shared a snippet of what's to be expected today, but uh, just to sort of break it down into the agenda for today, uh, first we'll do a small case discussion uh, for about 30 35 minutes. Then we'll try to form a dictionary on how you know one should be measuring growth and what what's the language that we should be using and just sort of internalize that. Uh, then I'll share a small template for you, uh, which you can take home, which you can uh, use for evaluating your own business. And then if there are any additional Q&A, then we'll power through that towards the end of the session. But in the meanwhile, I'd love for the session to be interactive. So if there are any questions, please feel free to stop me or put, put them in the chat in case I miss catching them on chat. If, if you could be kind enough to just point them yeah. out, that would be super helpful as well. Will do. Great. So I think... Uh, you had been given a small case, which was, hey, breaking news, uh, revenue is down 10% for your business month on month. I think it's a situation that uh, most of us in uh, building a consumer business encounter quite frequently, where there is some aberration or some uh, uh, deviation on a key business metric. Generally, that business metric is revenue. And then we scanter all over the place to figure out, hey, what really explained uh, you know, this dip in my business? Uh, so the idea was for all of us to, and I, I think even before we uh, started the discussion, a couple of folks mentioned some reasons, but it will be super helpful if uh, all of us can collectively brainstorm and come up with like sort of a master list of issues that uh, we typically encounter, uh, encounter especially in B2C businesses uh, that could lead to a 10% drop in revenue. So the way we'll do it is uh, we'll try to list down as many reasons as possible. Uh, and generally I've seen earlier cohorts cover like 40, 50 reasons in about 25, 30 minutes. So that will be my expectation here as well. So with that, would love for, uh, would, would love for uh, any of you to pitch in so that we can get started. I'd like to go ahead with the simplest reason that there is uh, no product innovation or there are no new products. The same old products are being sold all the time. Okay, so no product innovation okay. at once. Environmental factors. Could you uh, help uh, specify that a little bit? Like the war. Okay, or... so macro factors in this case, war, inflation, something like that. Uh, seasonality. Shalin, while we can see your screen, it's a little pixelated. Huh? Uh, no, this is pretty cool, but if you want us to read, it might be easier to sort of uh, share the screen though. Okay, and... uh, just give me one second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, give me one second. I have a okay. question here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is this reduction in sales only on the website or in total, including marketplaces? We have focused more on the website for this discussion. Okay. So then one of the reasons could be that the customer is getting better deals in other marketplaces. Yes. Yeah. Just give me one second. I'm, I'm trying to figure out why this is a bit pixelated. Just give me a second. Yeah. Sorry for that. I'm unable to share my screen, Sharad. I'll join back in. Let me just join back. Yeah, we just faced one of those issues, which is 
Also, Just give me one second. Yeah. Yeah, why Sheldon is coming? Yes, please put it on the chat. What are those reasons? Uh, and then we'll cover one by one. Yeah. I also would like to sort of state on record that this is the most active cohort in terms of number of responses we've gotten within the first one minute. <laughs> so I think Shalin has a lot of uh, catching up homework to do. Uh, yes, Shalin, I think Shalin's back. Hello? For some reason, I'm still not able to share my screen. Really? Uh, do you want to just give me the link of the... Uh, I'll meanwhile give you the link of the sheet while yeah. we... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I can just put it. Yeah, sorry for that, guys. I just updated my Mac OS, so I think it's something to do with this time. Yeah, perfect, got it. Yeah, I'll right. just put it. Meanwhile, Shalin, there's a lot of things in chat. <laughs> I'm still, I need access, huh? I just request my access. Yeah. What were the key reasons that people mentioned? The, uh, it's in the chat. Oh, okay, so you do not see the whole chat, right? Maybe we'll ask them to sort of say that again then. One second. Uh, Maybe like a new, better product in the market now. So competition. Competition. Com competition. New, newer competition. Got it. First, price, it. price competition as well. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying that uh, maybe start with the first principle of decrease in sessions or a decrease in conversion and then break it down further to understand uh, what uh, why this really happened in the first place. So, the market uh, relevance of the product has uh, is has reduced. Sessions have reduced and uh, the sorry, the last one was the relevance of the product in the market has got oh, issues. What if you're constantly out of stock and not being able to meet demand? And that's why eventually you're getting lesser, you know, a lot of sizes on your website are out of stock. Got it. Out of stock. Payment gateway issues. Payment gateway, fair enough. Manufacturing costs keep increasing. Actually, SEO failure, maybe. So cost of manufacturing, how would that affect revenue? If you could just interlink the two. How would that affect revenue? Uh, because it, uh, your ingredients, uh, the, whatever you use, they keep increasing or they, there's a delivery problem and all of that. Not just your uh, how the cost, even the timelines and how much, how long it takes you to get inventory gets affected. And that's the, it's a, uh, uh, it has an impact on your sales also. Your stocking, everything. Got it. So, got it. Under the broad bucket of supply chain issues. Yeah, uh, supply chain. Got it. Maybe lack of SEO optimization, like SEO is not lack working. Lack of SEO well. or SEO optimization, I anyway, mean, or optimization. Both. You may not even have it. Yeah. Right. Okay. New customer acquisition rate has been declining. Okay, I take it. Although that's more like an out. It's a sub output of the output. Uh, you could help with an input related to this. That'll be super. That'll be even more helpful. Falling out from the first page, from uh, on Google, Flip, Facebook, everything. I mean, uh, on Amazon, Flipkart. Falling off first page would basically be ranking on market, but that's ranking on marketplace. Whereas they're talking about websites. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what about uh, not being visible to customers on Google when they're searching for, say, like I have children's underwear. So if they're searching for you, but you don't come up, you don't rank anywhere. Would that come under SEO? Um, yeah. 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 Page speed uh -huh. and other website related issues. Uh, customer fatigue for your particular category. 
like they're just far too many customers or uh, uh, far too many uh, competitors saying the same claims and things like that and there's a uh, customer fatigue that uh, sets in shopping uh, journey is not simplified complex product journey you're talking about the product journey essentially uh, shopping journey the entire flow from uh, from the time you looked at a product to completing the checkout if the flow is not seamless discovery to checkout Okay. Uh, Changes the, in your marketing spends. Decrease marketing spends. Bad reviews. Uh, just overall drop in reviews. For reviews. Uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram have changed their like the way they rank your ads on the, their algorithms have basically gone a significant amount of change. Correct. So Facebook uh, policy or uh, yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. 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 And the delivery period might be like the products that they bought last time. They must have been delivered very late, so they don't want to rely on it. You like anymore? So you're saying the delivery was unreliable? Huh? We become unreliable because the delivery last time took some sure. longer time than the usual time. Oh, I'm very satisfied. They didn't receive it on time. Makes sense. What After sales service, have... customer relations. uh if you don't give proper customer relation uh after you sell the product the customer won't come back to buy it again after sales slash customer what if you don't have good uh, return policies or you know say your product is not returnable like here you can unmute yourself and share no problem okay uh higher uh, cac month on month the cac has increased so that's again an output uh, because if you're going to have lesser new user acquisition it's likely that you'll have higher cac yeah if you could link it to an input factor related to your business that will again help uh, maybe wrong targeting which is getting uh, you know customers not interested in your product on your website and the products sure makes sense um not enough uh, ui ux like the website design uh, the home page is not engaging enough so a lot of bounce rate even after customers coming in home page bounce rate okay not optimized uh, not optimized for mobile devices if large so, population is coming from mobile to your so i heard two issues one was the discount related point that someone was making okay. you yeah, are high discount by competitive Marketplaces during festive season they give very high discount. So, so competition has higher discount. Is that the point? Not competition. The marketplaces have higher during Pink Friday. Nike has a huge discount. Got it. So, In a way, you're saying it could also be cannibalization of the website sales because on the marketplace there was some discount. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry to remind all this. Now the mic becomes a little lower. <laughs> okay. Okay. Reduce okay. content or um, social media activity, influence activity. Reduced social activity, right? What uh, market outcasting as well. Like there are certain um, there are certain feedbacks from certain viewers, or let's say from certain customers that changes the perspective of the marketplace. So <clears throat> in a particular area, probably your uh, brand badnam ho jata hai something like that. So <clears throat> market so, outcasting. That would be uh, so. Uh, brand marketing failure is something like that is that what you're referring to yeah exactly exactly so the pr thing uh, is hey why i'll put that as a separate one because pr is a different uh, subset within a larger marketing bucket so i'll put bad pr as a separate one and target market saturation cg saturation if we are talking about the revenue then maybe asp drop average selling price drop in asp because of uh, maybe mix change portfolio change uh, so product portfolio change basically and leading yeah. to the if we are talking about revenue unit wise That's not right. not right. Revenue, revenue wise yeah but we should we should uh, take your point because we are talking about revenue let's go pull um uh, customer education customer, customer doesn't understand what your product is and why would that change month on month uh I mean, yeah, that could be one reason why the customer is not coming onto your platform itself. But then, completely depends on how many customers you're targeting month on month. So, uh, again, if you're targeting fewer people, 
we covered the point of fewer ads. So I'm just trying to fit this in somewhere, but still trying to figure out uh, what what should be the exact point we should write. <coughs> okay, let's keep going. Average order value declining. Yeah, that's this one. Average sales value or average order. Value. The product has changes a- in product category trends. Uh, if you can sharpen that a bit. Basically, like you know, some categories are now no more relevant, right? So okay, probably, so that uh, yeah, pro- there's something on relevance we had covered earlier. Product relevance reduced or reduced or uh, saturation of current product, something like that. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. For technology on the website, I know you've outdated. Maybe the UPI is not there or something. Else. So again, uh, a couple of issues. Uh, one, you're saying is tech issues, but that's a very broad one. So if you could sharpen that, and then. I think we have covered payment gateways. UPI is another type of payment that came in. Yeah, high uh, SLAs or serviceability issues? On, te- on the tech stack? Uh, serviceability issues on the fulfillment side. All right. Maybe I some pin codes have gone unserviceable or the SLAs, the promise times are very high. Relativity that times will also are need to drop in conversion. So, although you are delivering on time, but the time schedule itself is like one week away, 10 days away. And that, yeah, maybe that's... because of some embargo or something, uh, there is like... Uh, some pin codes are unserviceable in your current scheme of things. So fulfillment, basically fulfillment issues. Got it. Uh, Pricing is too high maybe um, for the same product. And we're saying month on month. So, uh, if you've you launched to... a new category of products uh, and the price is not suiting the customer's needs. A possible change in brand positioning or communication positioning, which is le- affecting the revenues. Okay, communication positioning didn't work. Maybe so, with just one addition to the last point one lady mentioned, uh, maybe change in discounts, reduction in discounts. So, pricing change. I'd like to add to that. Well, uh, I'm not able yeah. to focus. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, discount no, strategy. Okay. The product category doesn't allow you to uh, have repeat purchases. Or a, a different kind of a category which allows you to uh, getting customers back to the website. So you're saying that in, inherently my category doesn't have high repeat users. Yes. And so what do you think would have been the issue once on that? So uh, to, uh, to leverage having an opportunity to cross-sell with other accessories that are along with it. So okay, it, got it. Maybe uh, put, increase that, put that as to a cross-sell. Let me put it that way. So you sold one product, but you don't have something to cross-sell and build the user base. I like to add to this a uh, discount strategy. Uh, this usually happens is that uh, some people have their salary days by the end of the month, and some have beginning of the month. So they delay their purchase depending on what kind of discounts you give month on month. They understand your pattern, and then they delay their purchase accordingly. And at the end, they don't end up purchasing. Are you saying timing of the discount would be the issue? Timing of the discount, which is a pattern for your brand. For example, a particular brand gives a thirty percent off by the end of the month every month. The client understands that pattern and waits by the end for the end of the month, and then actually doesn't end up purchasing. So, could okay. repeat purchase okay. also okay. include like lack of subscription models, yeah. like or other buying models? Lack of subscription models, uh, but again, if there is no subscription model in the base period, I'm just wondering how that leads to a correction in this month. So it could be a bumper month, you know. A particular bumper month like so a jam month, month issue then, uh, uh, you know because of uh, an event or a festival example, and next month it could average out. With IPL, something yeah. like this where IPL. what if you're bootstrapped and don't have the money to advertise anymore <laughs> so that would again be marketing spend reduction i think yeah i guess okay net revenue also decreasing because of increased refunds and returns i think we covered that a bit earlier. Okay. Okay. How about uh, hiring issues? Uh, can you help uh, sort of connect the uh, dots on how that would lead to a revenue drop? Yeah, so maybe somebody that was running all of the sales or something uh, left the company and you have to rehire. Like, you may be scaling too fast, uh, not so being I able to keep up. I employee churn. I put that in the bag okay. of employees. Cool. Yeah? Yeah. That's a fair point. Yeah. And that's a huge uh, one. Surgeon- Search in local product copies. Let's say um, our product is copied in local markets, so we'll uh, the sales will go down anyway. So I would say competitive products slash copy catalog.
yeah again same cheaper products coming in from china or whatever it is so i guess i would fit into that the would, same yeah that is fit in the same thing which is competitive price yeah facebook cpm is being higher uh should we put that in okay so that's not necessarily a policy or algorithm change but cpms could be higher without these two as well so could you connect why uh, they could be higher i mean because of I mean, increased competition on the platform or uh... yeah yeah you're right so for example just to make it real in the ipl months the cpms will be higher yeah. because there's a lot of... so facebook google cpms are higher um maybe relying too much on facebook and google for your monthly sales and focusing no, but how, on that. if you could help uh, sort of derive from there that line of thinking how the month on month number would change um for us as our brand hasn't really been on uh, you know it hasn't explored performance marketing much this has been a space where uh, you know it looked po uh, po uh, more promising uh by but i think now I, when i interact with people who have been in this space i feel like there is a dip in conversion rate and everything else in the past few months maybe because the digital space itself is more crowded the return on ad spends is declining like performance marketing space being too crowded with uh, too many people using that as the main uh, marketing channel so again uh, wouldn't that okay we can say higher competition but actually higher competition will eventually lead to higher cpm I would say creative fatigue is. leading to uh, lower click rates and hence sessions. Uh, fatigue on our product or on the category or the ad? No, no, creative fatigue. I'm referring to uh, the Facebook promotions we are running. The creatives we are using, repeated use of same creatives might result into fatigue. With uh, the CTRs would reduce and overall sessions would reduce. Hence, uh, sales might decline. Okay. Uh, okay, what you, what should we crisply put that in as? That will come as a subset of visit sessions only. Right, exactly. I think more new new channels, new market. What about uh, Sorry, as someone as was saying new channels? What about I wanted to catch that point one. one. New uh, marketplaces like maybe Nike comes and explodes, and you're not on it. Or, I mean, for your category, not being on the new relevant channel. Okay, got it. So you, but again, that's a marketplace issue, not necessarily a website. Right. We could right. have some spillover. Uh, what, uh, one, one, one thing could be that we need to keep investing in the newer technology that keeps coming in. You know, so we 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 keep reinvesting our the revenue from the revenue a certain amount in upgrading our the tech that we use in our website and social media platforms for various purposes to. Bring the customer to our. Can you website. make it a bit more? Can you make it a bit more real? Because like there, suppose the new tech has come up, which we can integrate into our website. That will help us, like generate, uh, bring more traffic to our website. So, what and sort of tech are you referring to? I mean, that like uh, tech. Uh, I mean, like tech. 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 Uh, Parasar spoke about it that we should have a, a built-in software and this that sidebars, that side tools, and all those so that we keep getting in more customers. And then new tech is being built every day. You know the technology is being upgraded all the time. So uh, I mean, there are two parts to this. One is just you know how stable your tech is and how fast your tech is. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, stable and fast is like. Sort of improvements in the tech performance, and then there's improvement in the product performance. So uh, let me put the tech one first, which is tech uh, performance, so latency, instability. I think those would be the couple of ones. Downtime, and then product performance, the one that I'll take away from your. Uh, I think it's a compet uh, uncompetitive versus other players, basically. I think that's the issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes the behavioral change of the top management, attitude, complacency, motivational change can also affect the way the business is running. So intrinsic org issues, example, yeah. uh, uh, strategic misdirection. Okay. Especially channels in terms of where users are, like a TikTok comes up or a Snapchat becomes relevant. So maybe you're not present on the newer channels. 
that's fair. And then also too much reliance on say a TikTok and then it gets banned from your country, right? So elimination of key channel. Did we mention? Uh, yeah. Did we mention change in uh, taxation policies as well? Yeah, like GST we going up. So GST uh, would that be a macro issue? I think it would count under macro factors. So more inflation tax. Sure. Yeah. So if like um, uh, review process are delayed, uh, that may be considered as a strategic. Uh, change in the mode of payments offered now for example if you remove cash on delivery that could affect sales that's a good one yeah so uh, change in payment method mix basically example uh, pod remove and just on this uh, we can probably derive one more point related to this the lack of cash in hand at the time of delivering orders by people like people don't have cash People order products that leads to returns. Um, so, so sorry, sorry. Could you repeat that one? I mean, during demonetization, like people who you know, a lot of there are a lot of customers who order on cash because they have that liquidity, and then if due to whatever policy etc et changes, that doesn't happen. So sure. So I guess I would put again because it's like a once in a while event. I'll put that as a macro. Hmm. Uh. Your thirty fourth and thirty fifth point is the same one, oh, yeah. and the sec. Uh, I also wanted to say another reason could be that you're you're scaling too fast and you're burning up too much cash. That yeah. way, in, if that were the case, I would at least expect that your revenue number would be uh, positive, even if your burn and net and income number is. So good. you may not see it for a while. You may be burning it up too fast to see it. A lot so, of the startups that get funded, they, mm -hmm. and if they don't have a great team, it, it has been seen that they they scale far too fast and they burn up far too much cash to see the revenue come in. Uh, so I absolutely agree on principle. I'm just trying to connect that to a ten percent revenue decline. So are you saying that okay, I burned the money today that has a two month, three month sort of cycle of getting returns from it? Is that the point you're trying to make? Yeah, it will take some time before you will see. One could argue then that that would also show up in the base, right? Because the previous month will also have uh, that sort of a challenge. The previous one, as in? I mean, if uh, if your uh, sort of conversion cycle is long, mm. that that is going to be true for the previous month as well. So the, here we are talking about a month-on-month -month correction. So I'm still okay. trying to figure out how that leads to a month-on-month -month correction. Okay. Uh, operational errors creeping in due to scale. So give me an example of an ops error. So for example, uh, the team is not able to handle the number of deliveries or the orders that are coming in and errors start creeping in, which is why the brand loses its um, dependability and people stop ordering because they have poor issues in uh, delivery or product quality or packaging. Product quality is a new one. So I'll take that delivery, uh, delayed delivery or poor delivery experience is causing that. So you're saying product quality issue, a bit connected to the returns and refund issue that we had highlighted. But uh, yeah. this is one step back, so we should yeah we should include this as well. Stop. I mean, uh, the brand has stopped selling in a particular location. The brand has stopped stopped selling in a particular location. So basically, fewer markets now. Fewer markets. Stop. Yeah, fewer markets. Fair. Um, uh, suppose we are selling cross selling, doing the cross selling, and our partnership with that channel is no more. So then that will affect also affect us. Uh, disruption. Mm -hmm. So here you're talking about a distribution partnership, or you're talking about like a product partnership. Product partnership. If you could give me an example of that. Yes, yeah, Aki. What we learned in the last, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't have a website, but we were talking the last session that we should do a lot of cross selling and we generate uh, traffic from different channels. Like, uh, for example, Wakefit gave an example that they drive traffic from Mintra also, and if their collaboration stops or due to okay, okay, stalls, then that will affect. I'll put that as a distribution disruption. It just Mintra is also means of distribution, right? Uh, what else? Then uh, master SKUs, if not available, that also. Sorry, I missed that. For example, in our case, uh, 
So uh, strawberries, we are into the D2C of fruits and vegetables. So strawberry is a key SKU, which is not uh, available in many of the players. So if that SKU is not there for 10 days, then that will directly reduce a major sale. Got it. Critical SKU is missing. Maybe let's just, uh, let's take in the last couple of months. Uh, diversifying offline, which has affected online. Offline cannibalizing online. Offline uh, progress cannibalizing. Maybe warehousing issues, does that come under out of stock issues only? Uh, yes, I guess uh, out of stock is an outcome of warehousing issue. But we can list down a couple of warehousing issues. Just to yeah. go one step further back. If, do you have any specific warehousing issues that you thought about? It could be like mm -hmm. probably caught on fire or something. And you know, you don't have any products remaining. So uh, on-ground warehouse, uh, warehouse ops disruption eventually leading to like a out of stock situation. Yeah. What if, I don't know if we've covered this, but what if we stop making a best selling category, which was a best seller and which was giving us a lot of sale, but we had to stop making it for some reason. That's already mentioned. Or, or, it, or maybe you're adding a new product, which is competition to your current best selling, best selling category. So people are, not sure if they want to buy the current one or uh, wait for some more time for competition review. for yourself. Yeah, product, product, product cannibalization. Yeah, product cannibalization. Product cannibalization. Yeah, yeah. So you one product a... can... yeah. yeah, yeah. Within your customer base. Sure. I mean, just related to that, it could. Someone mentioned that. Yeah. For example, enough... we sell kids underwear, and uh, we can sell kids boxers, and now we've come up with a product called boxer briefs. Now they're kind of similar. It's very so little. that might cannibalize. Yes, the, yes. So I mean, yeah. just to extend that point a bit further, uh, someone had mentioned earlier that you know you launched a product which was a higher price product. The other is also a uh, true where you brought in a product which was lower price plus cannibalized your existing one. So that mm -hmm. led to a drop in average yeah. order value, which led to a drop in revenue. Okay, yeah. uh, I think uh, we've covered good ground. We've covered about fifty reasons. Uh, at least most of them are unique, at least 35, 40 unique reasons. So the idea of doing this was uh, firstly just to be aware of, you know, so many things that could be breaking when they're, uh, uh, when they're evaluating output, which is revenue. I know as uh, founders, we typically first think about, say, ad suspense comes at the whole yeah, you know, marketing could break out, yeah, okay. but if you think about it, like any part of your business, whether it's marketing or even customer support or logistics, warehouse, uh, product tech, I guess we need to keep a pulse on all of these and sort of have a, uh, you know, have a way to quickly identify which of these different buckets might actually be leading to the problem that we're trying to solve for, which is revenue growth, right? Uh, so that sort of gives us a good segue into first coming out with a framework, uh, sort of skeletal structure on debugging this problem. On debugging this problem, which is revenue growth. So in the next section, what we'll try to do is come up with like a framework or a skeletal structure, which helps us zero in on exactly where is the issue. Like, is the issue actually in, you know, uh, average order value? Is the issue in my Facebook ads or is the issue in the CPMs due to macro factors? I mean, you need to keep a pulse on this all the time. Right? So if there was a framework that helped us navigate through this a bit faster, um, I guess it would be helpful. So with that, I'll segue into the next section. Uh, Shad, please tell me you can see this clearly. Yeah, yeah I can see this clearly. <laughs> Great. If you don't, then let me know because I had prepared a couple of slides. I hope we are able to run through. We are them. good. We are good. Uh, other people just mute yourselves if you don't mind. So, yes. Yes, Shad. Great. So, I mean, the first thing that we can think about as we evaluate revenue, as someone had rightly pointed out, was is it even a volume issue in the first place, or you know, it's just that my average order value is down, uh, and your average order value could again be down because of uh, product mix or you know reduced prices discounts etc but just having that very basic clarity is super helpful because invariably one when talks about revenue degrowth one assumes that it's related to volume degrowth however that may not necessarily be the case uh, so it might actually be helpful to look at aov in terms of buckets of uh, orders Typically, we would do this, for example, quite often at Zomato, where we would uh, track very frequently, often on a daily basis or on days where we would see revenue slippage. 
uh, whether our low ticket orders had gone down, whether our mid tier orders had gone down, or the higher ticket uh, orders had gone down. So something that, like that, obviously the price points would be unique to your business and category. Uh, but that might just be like a very quick way to actually identify. Okay, here, here's what you know has actually broken, uh, and tracking the sales corresponding to each of these broad AOV buckets would uh, would be like the very first quick step that you could do just to sort of debug this problem of uh, you know revenue leakage. If you see that there's no real problem with AOV or you haven't really changed the product mix, then it's likely that it's the order bucket. So uh, on the order side, uh, again, uh, someone had mentioned that people are maybe transacting less frequently. Uh, some others had mentioned that, hey, maybe fewer users are coming on the platform. Both of these are different issues uh, and need different solutions, right? need different medicines. Uh, intuitively, one would think that it's a user's issue, uh, which means that uh, intuitively one would think that, okay, my category has a certain frequency, and therefore, I don't really expect, for example, you know, customers to transact one, more than once a month or more than once in three months or one, more than once in six months. However, for uh, relatively fast moving items, like for example, if you're in the uh, food space, now food, food will have a package food will also have a higher frequency. Uh, so in, in some of those categories, it, it's, it's very helpful to also track, track frequency. Uh, even frequency, we would typically break it down uh, further into like, Users who generally ordered one to two times, users who generally ordered two to three times, three to six times in a certain window, a time window, so that there also we were able to specifically point out a cohort of users whose frequency slipped and because of whom the overall frequency slipped. Uh, so that could be the issue on the frequency side. Having said that, uh, frequency is often very inherent to the category and the product and the price point at which you're operating. So there might be limited levers you have to move the frequency, loyalty programs, et cetera, could be ideas to sort of move the frequency, but uh, broadly inherently frequency is more deterministic of the, uh, more determined by the category and product and price at which you operate. So the other branch then is the user's branch. And uh, I'm in passing, I know that in our list as well, we mentioned that, hey, maybe new users have come down uh, or repeat users. So again, basis your product and your category, you might have a, varied mix of new versus repeat user contribution. So for example, just to give an example from Zomato, if the same thing was in Zomato's case, if I saw that 10% revenue is down, intuitively my gut would be that repeat user number is down. Why? Because in Zomato's case, the distribution of new versus repeat was about 80% of my business comes from repeat users, 20% of my business comes from new. So if the overall pie of new users itself is just 20%, it's very unlikely that the new user number would have dropped so drastically that my overall revenue would be down by 10%. Now I know that we are also emerging brands. So I would expect that in our case, it could be slightly different where we have a larger uh, dependency on new users for our business. Um, and therefore understanding each of these branches in uh, more detail becomes even more critical. So let's break that down further. So for example, a couple of folks had mentioned search as a reason for uh, for my business coming down, right? So one way to think about it is, let's first break it down into, okay, who is, who is my, what is the contribution of my organic users? What's the contribution of my paid users? Uh, something that comes from search, possibly likely that you will qualify that as organic, unless you're running ads on search in which it would qualify as paid. So if you were building the hypothesis that, you know, search led to, uh, uh, you know, so SEO uh, broke because SEO broke, I had a revenue slippage of 10%. Then the, then the base case, uh, you know, underlying situation has to be that first of all, most of your revenue has to be from new users and within new users, most of the traffic has to be from organic new users. And that's why the sensitivity to SEO and that's why uh, SEO might be a likely reason. But if that's not the case, then you can quickly move to saying, uh, okay, I don't actually have a lot of dependency on SEO. So even if we screwed up on SEO, it's unlikely to have such a huge fluctuation on my business. So let me go and figure out another reason. Uh, now paid is any ad that you're essentially running on Google, Facebook, or any of the other platforms and users that you are able to attribute uh, who have come to your platform because of those campaigns. So again, paid can simply be broken down into 
did my budgets decrease or my cost of acquisition increased right uh, so simply put if i was spending like 1 lakh rupees a month and now i'm spending 50000 a month so that's a uh, that's one reason to know okay i will have a decrease in uh, my overall revenue but again that may only lead to a 10% decrease in your revenue if you have a very high sensitivity to paid new users on your platform and therefore budget decrease has such a high sensitivity to your business that you have a 10% decrease cost of acquisition again uh, i mean how much does it cost to get a new user uh, so for example i could have exactly 1 lakh rupees spent in both the months which means that it's a cost of acquisition that is uh, that has gone up now cost of acquisition again we'll have to break that down further uh, but typically you would and i'll come to that in a bit but typically you would then start looking at stuff like cpms of facebook and cpms of google etc guys uh, are you with me so far uh, should i keep going thumbs up any questions if you want yes. to sort of yeah who's that okay very good yeah thumbs up okay so uh, remember we had uh, said that users are of two type new users and repeat users so we covered the new users branch now moving to the repeat user branch so another way to think about repeat users is okay i have folks repeating on the platform they can also be broken into two parts like uh, so say if i have 100 uh, 100 lifetime users okay who have transacted earlier of those 100 50 are probably or 40 are probably dominant and 60 are active which means that 60 come back to me in the subsequent month or 60 ordered in the last month uh in zomato's case for example the way we would define an active user is any user who had transacted in the last 30 days uh now that's that's obviously because zomato is a high frequency product but say in lower frequency products you might want to define an active user as okay any user who has transacted in the last 3 months or any user who has transacted in the last 6 months and everyone else who has transacted before that is a dormant user now uh active user again can be basically broken down into lifetime base and retention and i'll uh, guys feel free to stop me if, if i need to explain anything but uh, and I, and it will get a little more clear as we work through the uh, google sheet also to uh, some of these terms but i'd rather clear the doubts now itself so active user again is basically your total lifetime base in which in our example it was 100 lifetime base into retention which was 40% and so on average i have like active 40 users now this retention number is something again that i have seen to be yeah so someone's asked what is the meaning of lifetime base so say if we were sitting in the month of uh, june because june is just about to start so all the users that your business acquired up till end of may that would be the lifetime base essentially uh, if i was evaluating for the month of my business performance for the month of may then my lifetime base would be users who have transacted up to the end of april end of april yeah just the previous month right all the users i have acquired who have transacted with me ever up to the previous month okay so the retention so let's say example i have 100 lifetime users and i see like 10% retention of them every month we don't need to see a screen share we don't need to i'm just putting it on chat perfect so that means that i think i should in general expect at least i should expect 10 orders from repeating is that fine now why i'm bringing this point up is simply because retention in general is a number that is fairly stable for a product and category like uh, in zomato's case i hardly saw a monthly retention change across 3 4 years they were basically if we got 100 new users in 20 of them would stick around for in the next month so if so we are talking a month here but you could extrapolate it to like 3 months or 6 months if i say bought a tube light online i will probably not uh, retain on that tube light d2c uh, company for like a or 12 month period or a 6 month period something like that so retention again is very intrinsic to the product and category and okay. the reason for bringing that up here is simply because that knowing your retention will give you a sense of hey here's my base case of revenue here's the actual amount of orders i can expect without really doing anything great Uh, Sharan, so, so, can I ask you one question? So it's like uh, we are actually in the D two C foods and vegetables. So here, um, 
uh, our uh, the customer curve customer curve is stabilizing at around 20 percentage after uh, six to eight months then it's uh, stabilizing at a 20 percentage of the uh, thing and we are actually when calculating it's uh, our month on month customer retention is around 67 percentage so just yeah so i think you're talking about the dk that you see in retention so in simple terms if i got 100 customers in january in february i basically retained 60 of 67 of them who transacted in february but by the time it was june or july about 20 of them retained and the remaining churned is that fair ah uh, yeah that 20 would be that would be flat in our there yeah. correct so exactly what so you exactly see exactly what you see getting some echo uh, yeah, so exactly what you see in most consumer businesses where you would see a degradation in the month on month retention. So it's if you've got 100 customers today, maybe you will get uh, 70 of them back in the next 30 months. In the next six months, you'll probably get 20 of them back. And then probably that 20 number is what stays stable. Now, yeah. because we are young businesses, of course, we still need to establish, we will still need to uh, figure out really what is the, uh, you know, what is the uh, stable retention of our business. But at least tracking the monthly retention is also helpful. Like, okay, previous month I got 100 new customers, so I should at least expect one order, one order or five orders out of that that base. And two months back I had got another 100, so from there I should expect another two orders. So building that retention view just helps you understand the base case a little better. Of without adding any new customers to the platform, what's basically the uh, base case revenue that I should be expecting? Uh, Shalin, I have a quick question here. Uh, you've uh, distributed the uh, repeat user to dormant and active. Uh, this is very uh, unique to each business and each category, right? The definition of dormant and active, right? Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, whatever it doesn't classify as repeat is dormant. So in the matter's case, we would des describe any user who hasn't transacted in the last 30 days as dormant. They've okay. forgotten about a platform. They would probably have ordered food, but not from us. They would have ordered from competition. Got it, got it, got it. And having a viewpoint on dormant was also helpful because dormant users also resurrect, right? They also come back. Uh, so if out of 100 users on average, 40 repeated and say 60 were dormant, maybe from 60 in the, after a couple of months, I would at least see five of them transact. And from repeat customers out of 40, maybe I would see 30 of them transact. So I would see a higher return rate for the repeat customers, but I would also see some orders trickling in from dormant customers. Got it. So having that sort of a, uh, uh, you know, differentiation now, how is it useful in practical terms? Whenever you're backward looking or evaluating a business, you may it may help you to then see the performance of older cohorts. Right. Got it. So purely from that point of view. Uh, so, so one more doubt, uh, Shadin. Uh, so in the uh, so uh, the repeat users, you are only classifying dormant and active, uh, not like uh, uh, the chained ways or inactive ways. So such kind of classification is there. Uh, I, I heard inactive. I couldn't catch the one before that. Now, repeat user classification. This is like a, this is the very first version. It's like a V1 version, which is just bases a user's transaction history with us classification, right? You could obviously do many more classifications. For example, you could do a repeat user classification on, uh, uh, on whatever user segment you've defined. So you, you say you've defined a segment, which is like a high value segment, which generally orders with a higher value and you could just define one at a low value segment, which repeats, right? Uh, you could define, uh, uh, you could define basis, any other attributes that are unique to your business. Okay. But this one is just simply very, uh, you know, th this is something which is like a least common denominator across any B2C business. Okay. Yeah, so just to put this order bucket together, what we discussed essentially was, you know, first look at it is figure out which branch to even go into. You might not need to go into the user's branch if you actually see its frequency is an issue. And then again, within you, you uh, within users, you might want to check whether it's a new user issue or a repeat user issue. Uh, uh, basis the their respective contributions to the business, you might actually be intuitively able to say, okay, ten percent uh, degrowth cannot happen because of repeat users or 10 percent will happen because of repeat users so that's a characteristic of your uh, user mix and then uh, further segueing that into organic paid or with dormant active just a couple of ways to again really get to the core of the issue that your that your business is facing maybe uh, any question just look at the top level view i want to make sure uh, yeah anyone has any questions here 
thumbs up can we see a thumbs up uh, is the reaction so we are all together uh, shalun yeah so uh, i am one of the representatives from hop up we are a d2c brand uh, like uh, operating in electronics we are completely d2c one one concern about uh, repeat users is we do get a lot of repeat orders let's say uh, five orders uh, in a month which are from repeat customers what i wanted to understand here is since ours is a more technologically disrupting uh, uh, category let's say there is a, a different product or a different technology coming in uh, there is a lot of user movement what i was trying to understand here is shalin uh, we coming from a bootstrap uh, startup there are there is a lot of brand loyalty that is involved when we talk about repeat users so is it uh, so if a company is famous if a company has good pr and is all around the country or let's say has a good uh, let's say name to it in the country it has a good reputation it is pretty easy to bring bad brand loyalty but talking about uh, coming from a niche segment coming from electronics and as a startup is it any way possible is there a strategy where we can bring bring in brand royalty without let's say uh, doing a lot of pr or spending a lot on advertising or let's say reputation for I that mean, matter uh, i mean that's a great question uh, mm-hmm. and i mean the short answer out of of it is absolutely yes right because every touch point that you have with the customer even if there are few customers even if you have five customers or 10 10 customers that customer finally will come to your website so they will have a look and feel of your website so they will touch your brand there they will physically be touching the your brand when you ship out a product uh, so all of those become the core ingredients of you know how you can build loyalty if you have a great customer support if you have you know multiple payment options if you have smooth uh, returns if you have uh, if if a user faces uh, returns issues right so i mean the list of issues that we uh, mentioned if we mm-hmm. are able to build like a best in class process around them uh, then at least the so even what if we have we a hand- face with, uh, what we do face with repeat customers is that uh, our product is listed at marketplaces as well so a, pers- a person may be loyal to my uh, product he might like the hop up product he will like is the next version mai khareedunga but 90% of the repeat customers are going to the marketplace because it is they they, they are assured, they are assured because it's flipkart or let's say it's amazon rather than it is hop up so they would not they would come to my website they would uh, look at the price and then they'll be read, they'll go to amazon and flipkart to buy the same thing probably at a more cost but because they are assured ki ha ye product ghar pe aa jayega so that is some, an individual experience i cannot tell my customer to go and tell my other customers or let's say potential customers ki product aa jata hai so that is one so i think issue. what you're saying is okay how do i differentiate my own product was uh, on the website versus how it is being sold on the market in the market right? yes, yeah and right. give more, our product our website more let's say loyalty or importance for that so i'll i've become very loyal to this headphones company i just put in this name i think it's called headphone zone uh dot in this dot india.com there i'll i'll take an example from there like i used to buy the, this earphone also that i've bought i've bought now from headphone zone and i bought multiple audio products from there now the reason that i sort of was able to and you're also in the electronics category right you should probably look at how detailed their uh product breakdowns are how carefully they have uh i mean though, though that kind of information richness you will not find on uh, you you will not find an avenue to display that on amazon and uh, flipkart uh, links to youtube videos reviewing the product testimonials detailed product breakdown like then their own uh, sort of they are a very small team but they, their own experts uh, sort of unboxing reviewing it etc so especially in a high uh, i would say high purchase item uh all of these things led me to believe that okay these guys are actually you know even if they are really really small they seem uh genuine and they 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 are sort of the information richness was much more persuasive and much more uh you know influential for me versus having seen the same product on their market on the marketplace uh so that became a factor for me now of course your point i think you added a secondary point which was related to logistics uh and logistics most of us i believe would be relying on some sort of a third party logistics player uh intuitively i feel at least in the urban markets the third party logistics has reached a space where uh, the quality of uh, delivery is like very predictable so in the sense it's a good thing for the user because it's not that you know your uh, timelines on delivery are going to be significantly higher than a 
uh, Flipkart or an Amazon. Yes, Amazon might for its prime members be able to deliver it a bit faster. But I don't know if that's the main purchase criteria while especially purchasing high ticket items. Uh, so probably, uh, I mean, I, I, and of course this question is like a very deep question. So I, I can only give a flavor of an answer, but if I were just to set you off and give you an example, then I would probably use this company as an example. And I'll research it. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Uh, so again, coming back to the framework, this is one way to break down your uh, volume. Uh, another way to break down your volume is now looking at it more with the ad lens. So some of us started directly with the ad lens, right? So now that's where this comes in. When I first break it down into, okay, uh, am I actually getting enough traffic with, on my ads? Uh, actually, uh, yeah, even, let's take a step back even before that. Uh, the other way to look at traffic and conversion is first on my own uh, website. So our, if 100 people are coming on my website, 20 of them are fine, or five of them are finally purchasing. So I have a conversion percentage of 5%. Now conversion percentage, of course, is significantly influenced by many things. And uh, con uh, so for example, how fast your homepage loads up, what's the first few items that you have shown on the homepage and are they relevant to prevent bounce off? Uh, I mean, is, are, are products easily even visible and is it even easy for the user to understand really what you're offering? The marketing language that you're using on the homepage. And then each part of the product conversion, typically would, we would break that into subsequent uh, steps. Someone called it user journey. But yeah, I mean, we can say that, okay, going from the homepage to the menu page, from the menu page of, or the listings page, from the listings page to uh, the product page, from the product to the cart page, from the cart page to payment, payment to, uh, you know, payment to checkout. Uh, and uh, after checkout also, you might have some customer support. So these are the different legs of conversion or these are the different steps of conversion of a user. And you will have to break down uh, at a very uh, basic level, whether it's a conversion issue or a traffic issue. Conversions tend to be more stable. Traffic tends to be more volatile, but conversion is very, very helpful because a small change in conversion can lead to a significant uh, a significant change in uh, business without actually spending on it. Like for example, uh, someone was mentioning, okay, in my product, I have given a filter option and I'm not given a filter option with filters. Probably the conversion is slightly more. So those are the kind of specifics that you would then think about. And in our example of a 10% revenue degrowth, you'd probably think about, okay, um, I got the same traffic on my homepage. Now conversion dropped. So someone mentioned UPI is an issue. So if UPI is an issue, then it would, basically show up in the last leg of conversion, which is checkout page or payments page, right? Uh, so those sort of uh, issues can then be quickly validated with the metrics that are uh, specific to conversion to then know, okay, this was really the issue. And this is how I could have sort of, in the future, I can future proof that issue. So now traffic is simply traffic that I uh, got onto my website and that can be broken down into again, organic traffic or paid traffic. Uh, paid traffic is simply traffic driven by marketing campaigns. So paid traffic again can be broken down into two uh, buckets. How many people are seeing my ad and then how many people are clicking on the ad when they see it. Uh, so it's called click through rate CTR. Typically these CTRs are uh, basis where you place the ad they vary, but uh, just to give you an example, say if it were an Instagram post, typically you would see a CTR ranging from say 0.5 to 1.5%. Uh, now, uh, again, these CTRs also, I've, they will be a function of the ad copy. And therefore with a very good ad copy, you might see a slightly higher CTR, but it's unlikely that your CTR will change from a point, say 1% average to a 10% average. Uh, so just to, it's good to be aware about like, what's your baseline CTR, like what's good, bad and ugly on the CTR side. Typically it will be range bound basis, the type of channel that you're uh, posting your ads on or the kind of inventory that you have purchased. Like for example, if you've purchased Google display network, which is like a banner ad that you would see on a website. Now that's going to be something at the end of an article or the side of an article that will see like very low CTRs of 0.1, percent et cetera. Uh, Eyeballs is just the impressions you get, uh, how many people are viewing your ad, right? Now, that again can be broken down into, I hope it's visible, but yeah, basically you can bro break it down into budget and you can break it down into CPM, the cost per impressions. 
uh, and then you might want to investigate it for every single channel that you have. So if it's a, a cost per impression issue, then on exactly which channel is there a cost per impression issue? And if say Facebook CPM was the issue, then Facebook CPM will eventually affect my eyeballs number. So can I, could I have had a better copy with which had led to a say slight increase in CTR, which offset the budget, uh, which offset the fewer eyeballs. Uh, so those are the things, I mean, that's, uh, those are the ways to sort of break down uh, where your, you know, uh, again, where your growth number is uh, taking a hit. So now if you're having a hard time visualizing this, I've tried to, uh, I've tried to put it together into one common chart. One second, let me just open that chart. Are you able to see this? Yeah, yeah, we are able to see it. So I'll share the link to this file as well, but whatever we discussed, all the bits and pieces eventually come together into this one common snapshot view of your business that you should be building for and having literally by your bedside uh, at most times. So that whenever there is a slippage in revenue, you can zero down on the uh, zero down on specific brand branches and you can uh, ask any specific team members related to them to just double click and help you understand these a little better. Does that make sense? Helpful? Can we get like a reaction on thumbs up? Uh, the reaction, not the video. Uh, <laughs> okay, perfect. Or any questions that I can uh, take just on this specific one? Any questions? You can raise your hand also to unmute yourself and ask. Hey, Shalene, uh, this is Aditya. Uh, so we spoke about retention on a monthly basis. Uh, uh, can you also elaborate on uh, how you look at uh, cohort analysis uh, and uh, how you compare that to a typical monthly retention and which one is the right uh, lens to look at uh, in, a, in a given situation? Yeah, so great. So uh, I would say that cohort is the next level of analysis if you have a retention problem. So like, for example, if your retention is dropping, then you might want to go into cohorts and look at how did Jan cohort perform versus Feb cohort versus, uh, you know, March, et cetera. And then how did they uh, age with time, right? Because cohort analysis effectively helps you understand the aging of a certain user uh, bucket. But is that even an issue will come through like a single retention number? Okay, so it's good to look at the monthly retention numbers and then there is first an issue and then get into the cohort retentions. Yeah, exactly. Because that may not necessarily be an issue in the first place. If it is, then cohort is the natural extension. Rohan, yeah, unmute and then Samit. Yeah, uh, Shwain, thanks for this. Um, just want to ask you, like, is there like a set, like how you mentioned, like a CTR value of around 0 0.5 to 1.5% is like a standard. You know, in terms of retention, uh, is it sector-wise significantly standardized, you know, or is it very different for each business? I think it's more to do with category than product would be the first level answer. So like, I'll give you an example of something different, but in the consumer space, like gaming, right? Now there are different types of games you have. You might have like hyper casual games, puzzle games, bo uh, you know, casino games, etc. And I've looked at data of like 150 different types of genres of games and within the genre i've looked at the uh, you know i've looked at basically individual games i found it that found that the genre specific retentions are significantly different like a casino game will have a different retention versus a casual game but within the bucket of a casual game or casino game there is some difference not a lot uh, of course with a better product with fewer ads etc one game will probably have a, a little bit more retention but think about it right if i have to purchase something especially which is functional then it's likely that the retention is going to be very uh, you know standardized like if i have to purchase a toothpaste it's very likely that my retention for toothpaste is going to be similar to category so the differentiation for me is to go and get more new users because it's going to be very high very difficult for me to convince someone to buy more toothpaste in a certain time period but if it's something like apparel, where there is a good enough opportunity to cross sell, if you bought a t-shirt from me, buy a trouser from me as well. Uh, and how well are you able to do that? Uh, then there would be some sort of a retention uh, delta that you might be able to generate versus category. So also depends on whether it's a functional or a discretionary sort of purchase as well. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thanks. Thanks. Um, hi, Charlene. So, um, firstly, thank you. You've explained this pretty well, and it's very interesting. Uh, I'm ex Zomato myself. We used to be there in the days when there was just a farmhouse. Oh, um, fantastic. <laughs> I worked with Dipinder in Bain and oh, dragged amazing. me out of Bain to Zomato. What are you up to these days? Just like quick, quick I'm, one. I'm listening to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll catch up later. Great. No, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You had a question. Yeah, so the thing is, uh, so I see Zomato with, you know, a lot of team strength and stuff. So I have two questions. One is uh, the lens out here of this matrix. When I look at it, it is uh, very centric to an app or the website from where the revenue is being generated, right? And for a lot of us, the revenue can re reside not just on our website. It can come in through, um, you know, from offline channels can come in through hotels, marketplaces, wherever it is. So A, how would you sort of add that, uh, you know, um, you know the, the lens of the revenue, which is not coming from the website and how would you sort of, because that's, that's one space where the revenue is coming in, but you don't have visibility of who bought it, how many people came back and what is the repeat percentage. Sure. But there is some visibility because it's coming in, right? So you can definitely see that there is repeat business. So that's one uh, first question. The second question is, uh, you know, I've been in teams where there was a lot of data support, uh, you know, after the matter in Twitter and stuff. So when you're starting up, you don't have that much bandwidth to track every data point, which you'd love to track. So all of this stuff you'd love to track. So if you were, you were me, you know, any of us, and you had very limited team strength to actually track this, what would you focus on as a two things which you would not go, uh, you know, without tracking in just in terms of prioritization? Because um, a lot of times, you know, uh, between the zillion things that we're doing, uh, it you can sort of lose track on what is the most critical thing that you have to do in 24 hours of the day versus what's not. So I just want to, um, you know, address both as to the whole offline space. And the second is about the whole uh, prioritization space in terms of metrics. Got it. So I'll address the second one first. Uh, and a bit of a selfish reason for that as well. So I think there are two parts to your, uh, two parts of answering your question. First where part was, key, what should I even track as like the most critical ones, right? Uh, in terms of knowing, you know, uh, where I have an issue in the business because so much of tracking is going to be difficult. And the second was how do I actually do it when I don't really have the uh, resources that a large funded company might have. So on the first part, I mean, one quick way to think about it is that if you're constrained on exactly what you can track, you might just want to track the upper branches uh, at a high level so that at least at a high level, you know where the issues are, right? So these very high level branches without even going into the sub branches or maybe going up to the sub branch of new users will just give you a very quick pulse of, uh, or that, that could do these four, one, two, three, four, five, these four, five metrics could basically be something that you look at at a higher cadence. And if everything's good, obviously you don't need to go into any of these branches, right? But where you think things are breaking and there might be revenue leakage, then you might want to choose and identifying that revenue leakage at just a very high level through these main branches might just suffice. Now to your second, uh, to the second part of answering, okay, how do I actually do this when, you know, I'm an early stage startup, I don't have like large funding, large tech and analyst teams. Well, the good news is that's exactly the problem that, uh, you know, we are solving for with our sort of SaaS startup, trying to build a no code, uh, no SQL based platform that helps you uh, pull some of this data and generate reports and automate them, set alerts like literally in a couple of minutes without needing any technical knowledge. So trying to solve for founders who want visibility on their data, but don't really have the time, effort or bandwidth uh, to be able to do that purely without any technical knowledge. So uh, can sort of chat offline on the specific problems you, you might face and how we might be helpful. But uh, we in Zomato, we had to invest a lot of time on uh, creating the teams and manual workflows that helped us with tracking this we think that it can be automated. So that's essentially what we're building for. Your first point was on, okay, uh, this is all cool for website, but you know, my uh, business is spread across website plus marketplace plus offline. So how do I really uh, use this framework at all there? 
So my concession is that you can use uh, elements of this for sure. Some very specific ones you may not be able to use, like for example, wherever there is depth of user data needed. Uh, like if you need very specific data on a user or some sort of an attribution on the user, like for example, on Amazon, if someone is tra transacting, you might not get a lot of user data, but at least the high level of breaking it down into, you know, uh, you might not get, you will actually even be able to get frequency data because, you know, you have, uh, do you get, do you get any sort of customer signal from Amazon? Like a email ID or a phone number? So, yeah, so we are on FBA as well as we do a bit of, we, we don't put everything on FBA. So the stuff that's on FBA, you don't. Um, and uh, there is a brand analytics part, which can give you certain amount of analytics, but we do see a pattern of very strong repeat user rate. And it's very um, uh, periodical in terms of two months to two and a half months. So it's very interesting, you know, like to see, uh, but uh, at the same time, collation of all of this is a difficult part. I'm not sure if there's a plugin for the SaaS model that you said, which is integrated into, it's uh, I'm pretty sure they will mean, not, it'll be a wall garden uh, from their end. Um, but, you know, like, it'll be interesting to know. You, you do get some data from uh, the API uh, from Amazon and from Flipkart. Uh, so uh, what we are building is also, you can pull that data into Google Sheets without you know, any effort. But you will not get a lot of data on Amazon, but at least some of these, again, uh, go through this and you will find that some of this data you will be able to get. All of this is like your data, right? Uh, for example, traffic conversion. This whole branch is your own campaign set up. So that will get you. OV, again, you will, have, you will get a sense of, you know, what is the average order values you're getting. You'll see the billings and you'll be able to see it. Uh, user frequency and specifics within the user branch. Possibly that might be a bit of a challenge in... Uh, uh, marketplace or offline, but at least some parts of this framework can still apply. That's that's broadly the point. Okay. Any other questions before we move to the next section? No, we're good. So the next question is partly related to what, uh, or the next session is partly related. Part of the session is related to what Somya just asked, which is, uh, okay, how do I even track this, right? So like, where do I even go from here? How do I track it? Is there something I can take, which will uh, be easy for me to just uh, as a template to start using from day one. So we've created this, is this pixelated or is this good? It is uh, pixelated, hard to read. So Sharath, can you open this sheet? Yeah, or can you have access to this sheet as well? Yeah, yeah I have, I, do you want to just put uh, Yeah, I'll just move it aside and then. Second. Can you just ping yeah. me the link if you don't mind, or maybe DM yeah, me? I'll just, ping, yeah. I'll just ping it to, yeah. Okay, just give me one second. In the meanwhile, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer those. I'll be just looking for any questions. Yeah, I've DM'd you on Zoom chat, Sharad, so you should be able to pick it from. Uh, hi, uh, so I uh, represent a brand called Kapchi, which is a uh, green tea cups, basically. Uh, so we have online and offline both as the sales channel that we're doing. So we did a pilot launch in uh, Thani where we were available in certain stores. So I was getting a lot of uh, repeat purchases there in terms of offline. But when it came to online, uh, I got a lot of impromptu purchases, like one-time purchases were a, lo uh, a lot. But when it came to repeat purchases, there were not many of them happening. So, uh, so uh, what what was your product? Uh, what, what matrix specifically should I look as green tea in it? You just need to pour hot water, and the green tea is ready. So it's so you're saying what like a green tea product. product. So Jay, I think we can't hear you because there's a lot of connection. Uh, in terms of uh, let's say I see. Why don't you sort of ask a question in chat, and then shall okay, we? I'll just uh, put it on the chat. Yes, yes. Challenge to me, Shaira. Yeah, uh, I'm still trying to figure out if I can share it because there's some formula here. So just, yeah, so just give me one second. Perfect. Uh, so when I look at the question, how do we get access to your software? So a live can, yeah, just wait for a couple of weeks where like in the early beta phase, I'm just trying to uh, get the product launched. We've been building it since the last three, four months. So 
one of those key reasons I can convince Shalin is to do the session is you can get live product feedback from all of you guys <laughs> because the real problem statement and he's sort of really an expert in solving it. Uh, so yes. Eight second. Uh, let me just see if I can share it. I stop you know, sharing. Sorry, I didn't anticipate this issue. Just give me one second. If it works, it works. Otherwise, should have been working. Yeah. I don't try. I mean, how much is it? Share screen, that thing. I mean, you should be getting it, right? Ah, actually, uh, I mean, there was some system privacy thing. I just tried to fix that. Okay. Do it. It will be great because it will just. Yeah, I agree. Yes, I'm not able to. Okay, you go ahead with your. My sharing, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I'll shut up. Present the first tab is essentially what I called L zero metrics. So, Mike uh, Shalana, uh, Mike Lilla. Yeah, sorry. Again, uh, links back to the question Swami was asking, which is if I had to track just a few things, then what are the most critical things that I should be uh, uh, tracking, right? So just to go back again and link this with our example, we said revenue was down 10%. So now that I have this tracker created, it gives me a quick sense of, uh, you know, most of the degrowth being actually from orders, 8% of the degrowth is all orders and 2% is actually slippage in average order value. Now, again, in orders, you might have multiple channels like web and web app, uh, marketplace, et cetera. Right? So even if you're looking at your business holistically, you might just want to break it down uh, in this way. And see actually where uh, was the revenue slippage. On the average order value front, I've seen a two percent slippage. Now the uh, good news and bad news. The uh, the good news is that it seems that the the low ticket size items seem to be working well because twelve percent of my order mix was uh, low uh, low ticket values. Now it's gone to four percent. So that's a seventeen percent increase. But but the bad news is that, you know, on the higher ticket size, I've now then seen a uh, slippage. So this, now, if someone were forming the hypothesis that, okay, probably, you know, low ticket orders have gone up, then the quick way to validate that would be through just having a view like this. And so that will explain partly the loss that you've seen on, on the average order value size. You can obviously change these price points based on your business type. I've just taken some directional ones. So if we scroll down now to the traffic and, uh, conversion piece. So this is basically traffic on your website and conversion on your website. Uh, and you can again have a channel view at it. So for example, one of the things that we did not cover in our 50, uh, Arne, you're, webinar, you're not audible. No, we can hear you. Shana. It's okay. 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 All right. Uh, if needed, I'll go on video mute, but yeah, uh, continuing, uh, one of the things we didn't cover was basically web and web breakdown because when you've created a website, a lot of them might actually be looking at your embed product, uh, simply purchasing on the mobile. And so differentiating that is also very critical. So now, uh, and also your ad campaigns are also unique to web and unique to embed. Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, they can potentially be, if you want to create web specific ones or embed specific ones, you can potentially do that. So that's uh, that's another lens that you should constantly keep in mind because when we think of website, we just assume that most people are purchasing from desktop or just from mobile, which is our category. Uh, and likewise, the product funnel is hugely different for web versus mweb. Uh, even in Zomato's case, I had seen that, you know, uh, we had a very significant difference on mweb. In our case, mweb was obviously a better performer because you would have location that would be picked up automatically. Uh, and that itself led to some better conversion, but you should track the uh, funnel conversion basis, the type of channel that you have as well. So if you just had to have a very high level zoomed out view of your business, maybe this could be a very straightforward starting point. I think all of us would have uh, enough time to at least set this first level view up. So with that, we can then go MWeb means, yeah. I mean, if someone know MWeb means not mobile app, MWeb means if I, uh, you know, open uh, flipkart.com on my mobile phone. So that's called mobile website. And again, mobile websites also have different versions. Like you have progressive web uh, app, which is like the most, uh, which is the best in class version of a mobile website. So there are different gradients within mobile website as well. You might have page speed issues on mobile uh, website. Like for example, if you're 
putting a lot of images on your uh, a lot of unoptimized uh, high high res images on your m web it's possible that in india with patchy networks you might see very high bounce rates so you might want a custom m web m site or mobile website versus the desktop website that you have and this can just become a quick signal for that uh, yeah now i think sharad we can move to the user mix section so all of this by the way just borrows from the previous session on the uh, previous part of the session on growth dictionary but just makes it a bit more real by putting it into a playable template so again on the user mix side going back to the case we said you know there's an 8% dip in orders so this now gives me a sense of 6% drop in users and 2% drop in frequency so the 2% drop in frequency i'll ignore because uh, uh you know that's a little going to be a little tricky to explain frequency but the user one i can straight away from the sheet see that it's a bit obvious that intuitively i thought it might be a new user issue but actually it's a repeat user issue in fact in this business if you have a look at it there's a huge dependency on new users but it's not the new user number that so 83% of my business actually comes from new users and about 17% or uh, thereabouts comes from my repeat users now uh, in this particular instance you saw that the repeat user dropped significantly so now then you can start forming a hypothesis and start looking at cohorts to basically see okay why did i see such a drop in repeat users uh, and then you might probably find out that okay 3 months back maybe i did a marketing campaign where i hugely discounted uh, give a huge discount now that or maybe i ran an ad on a, a lower quality channel hypothetically let's say like a a tiktok equivalent and uh, that brought in some traffic and conversion but that conversion came mainly because of products being on discount it was a very poor quality user base and then that led to subsequent uh, drop off in the next month in one example i think we need to see the relate to is like cred uh, cred as a channel to in terms of acquiring users by discounting uh, if you don't end up getting repeat <laughs> that's one of those things that you might associate with Yeah, someone has a question whether this will be shared uh, with me. Everything will be shared. So even the uh, PDF that we uh, looked at or the Figma file that I used for the flowchart, I'll share that as well. Okay. Actually, uh, there's a question. Actually, you want to ask? Quick. Hi. Hi. I'm Audible. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, Shalin. Uh, i would want to understand this repeat users in feb and jan so you are comparing repeat users of feb as compared to jan when you say repeat users what time frame you are referring to here three month repeat six month repeat month on month repeat what is the time frame so, you know as i clarified earlier in the uh, uh, growth dictionary part uh, repeat user definition purely up to you how you want to define it but if i am say simply defining it as uh, you know one month old uh, one last month active right. users uh then in this particular instance what might have be the case is ki last month active users mein maine i have seen a drop in feb right i have seen 93 so previous last ek do month ke mein cohorts i would typically analyze to see if there was the it was the jan cohort that i acquired which was very poor quality or a december cohort because invariably between these two cohorts there would have been something that led to a slippage in feb if your category has like users repeating once in two months then the feb number will be influenced by the december guys who came in if your category has generally a month on month behavior then it might be the jan users that you got who subsequently didn't show up in december if your category has like six month users typically transact once in six months then you will have to compare feb with maybe uh, the folks that you got six months back and jan with uh, jan with it six months back and then compare Okay, fine. And one more thing, uh, you know. So if we notice a drop in say sessions, mm. okay. So so let's say traffic is is reduced. How do we go about uh, you know breaking it down on Amazon? Because we you know do you have any idea of doing it? If is you run first? click to uh, if you run click to Amazon ads, I mean if your ads are pointing to Amazon, then I would go and investigate the ads on Amazon. Or if you have SEO leading to Amazon, I would investigate those two. So there are actually four points here. One is the ads on Amazon. Second is the ads on Facebook we run to drive traffic on Amazon. Third is the SEO bit, and fourth is the organic part. Perfect. Like right. search on Amazon. Perfect. Now this is really confusing. You know what is contributing what? 
So, so uh, I'm. Do you have any template or something? Because you are showing something that you know, which might help us. I so, will move to the marketing bucket where we can. Uh, we 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 can cover it. So if if let's hold let's park this for a bit later. If the marketing tab, which is a couple of tabs down the line, if that doesn't cover it, then we'll come to uh, then we'll separately address it. Works? Yeah yeah sure. Just one last thing. Uh, would that also cover? Uh, say for example, the traffic from Facebook is down. Would that also cover which campaign is not able to perform? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Thanks. That helps. So. Uh, so i think we covered the uh, i mean from this first table table 3 basically we were able to gather that uh, repeat users are down now uh, the next one is basically breaking the repeat users down into like a uh, yeah so that's table 4 so table 4 is essentially breaking it down uh, into uh, shalin i had a question on the frequency average so i'm just wondering if... i mean how have we calculated the frequency for new users i mean how how does that work sure so i'll give you a example from here so new user frequency is okay i had uh, say in the month of may 100 new users so these were users who transacted for the very first time on the platform hmm throughout the month the total number of orders i generated from them were 110 okay, okay. so then my new user frequency is 1.1 Okay. and repeat okay. users i might have had like you know uh, 50 repeat users and those 50 transacted 70 times so 70 by 5 to mm. 1.4 roughly that would be so the reason i've sort of demarketed it is because at least in our uh, you know in zomato and it could be true for other uh, d2c businesses as well huge difference in new user versus repeat user frequency mm. typically mm. new user frequency for zomato was about 1.5 so which meant that if i tried the platform uh, this month I'm likely to transact 1.5 times, times if I'm a new user. But if I was mm. a repeat user, it was about 3.5 to 4. Mm. So I'm already uh, you know that crossed that habit form uh, formation uh, hurdle, and now I'm sort of pretty active. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Shalin, time check. Three fifteen. Yeah. So I'll. Uh, so again, the this one repeat users base and retention that. Uh, This is just saying, okay, how many users did I have at the beginning of Jan, and then how many users did I have at the beginning of uh, Feb, and then comparing the retention, then I see that most of the repeat user degrowth can be explained by the drop in retention rates, which means that now I'll have to do that cohort analysis that we spoke about, which will tell me, okay, from the previous months, which were those bad uh, users that I had got. Which led to a drop in fit, and that's this. So I hopefully I've answered that question uh, because I had uh, mentioned uh, mentioned it verbally, but now this is just a way of visualizing, where basically I've created a cohort, and then this is the month zero of acquisition, and then these are the subsequent months. I think I should take a couple of minutes. I know we are short on time, Sharad here, but just. No, okay. We can take. We can take. Yeah, please take minutes. Yeah, come on. So again, the way to read this retention percentage table is: in October, I acquired six forty-two new users, of which in the subsequent months, this was the number. These were the number of people who came back. People who came back back to me, and then converting that to a percentage gives a view like this. So now, ideally, what I would see. Is month one retentions compared with each other, month two retentions compared with each other, and like and so on, so forth. And then I would see okay, where where exactly have I as have I seen a drop off? Does that make sense? Now also just to highlight, we will do a entire session on cohort tracking. <laughs> Two hours, but yes. Yeah, first. but uh, yeah. So that's great then, because then we we'll, uh, we can move a bit faster on this. But broadly, the idea here was that if you find repeat users an issue, break it into retention and uh, lifetime users that you have in, up to that point, and then if you want to break retention down further, create a cohort table. Uh, how to read a cohort table? Like since it's getting covered later, then we can probably move to the product part of this. Shalin, one quick question. One quick question. Uh, so in this, uh, so this is helpful. Thanks for sharing. Uh, how do you typically identify 
the life cycle that you want to attribute uh, for a user, right? I mean, obviously it varies from business to business. You have different users buying at different frequencies, but when you're doing a cohort analysis, it becomes important to say that this is the life cycle uh, in, after which I'll say that the user is repeating, right? So what is the thing to keep in mind while you're kind of identifying that is it three months, six months, nine months or whatever? So if you see an inflection point, let's say hypothetically, let's say thousand users had come in month zero. In the, after which the second month, only 10 of them came back. And then 15 or maybe eight of them came back in the second month. But suddenly you see that, you know, 20 people came back in the third month. So my retention percentage in third month is actually, so this is a smile curve, which is called a smile curve. So initially, okay, I bought say maybe something functional, like I bought, a, uh, maybe I bought five kg of Atta and that lasted me for two months. So I had no reason to come back in month one, month two, but I will sort of run out of it in month three. So eventually I should be showing. Right? So uh, th now this, uh, this sort of an increase in retention in, in a later month becomes a signal that, okay, here is the inflection point. So on average, people are maybe returning in three months, not in the next month. If this continued to degrade, like if this continued to go down in subsequent months, then probably, I mean, the first month is the, the subsequent next month is the hottest month in the sense that's the month that you will want to then solve for. Because people are coming and buying mostly in the subsequent months and then just dropping. So you basically wait to identify the inflection point and that's when you, that's what you kind of define as your period. Exactly. Understood. Thanks. Uh, okay. So we can go to the product uh, tab. So on the product tab, as we uh, had discussed and someone had mentioned, can I sort of again uh, break that down further one step back? So you would have traffic from multiple sources. But I've just broadly listed the four or five sources that you might have traffic from. Uh, and you can use GA for attribution and figure out what traffic you got was organic, what were, uh, what traffic you got was from say Facebook, Google, and other paid tools, what traffic you got from social. So these are broadly the buckets. You might have some affiliate marketing you're doing or your agency is doing. Then you might want to ask them, okay, what's the traffic that they are bringing? And typically what will happen is that the conversion percentages, this is the type of source are going to be very, very different. So someone who's landed on your website organically likely to have a higher conversion percentage purely because the intent is higher. Someone may be coming through affiliates might have just been sort of, uh, it might just have been a click uh, bait that was done to get the click generated from them so that the user came onto your uh, website and then the subsequent user, subsequently the user dropped off. So having that knowledge is helpful to then go back to your marketing agency and say, hey, you're spending a bunch of my money on affiliate marketing. You know, what really is it bringing on the conversion side? At a high level, you can also use this to just identify where your deviations in conversion. So for example, in this particular uh, example, your social traffic is down. So someone had mentioned as a reason, Ki, I'm not as engaged on social. Sure, but is that actually leading to a drop in uh, uh, you know, social attributed traffic in this case it is so then okay you would say okay that's a fair hypothesis and in this case your paid traffic conversion is lower so what might be happening is you try to change the channel mix you were doing google and facebook ads and you did say google and trend or you did google and some uh, third party affiliate uh, or not an affiliate but some other uh, you did google and snapchat for example so then that will show you okay what is the quality of the conversion i'm getting this is the new marketing mix that i have Paid marketing books. Make sense? Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, next is on the product. Are we on the product funnel one? Yeah, we can go. We can go lower, uh, Sharad. Sorry, yeah. So, product funnel is breaking the same thing down, but more. A detailed view of your own website, uh, website or, MBIP, uh, or mobile website, right? So, uh, as I said, we should break it down into how many people went from a home page to product page, product to cart, so on and so forth. And all of the hypotheses that we wrote earlier will help you to sort of those hypotheses can actually be validated if you have a view like this, because otherwise you will be sort of just. Uh, hypothesizing without data. Like for example, we said UPI time, you know, UPI was slow or UPI had a latency. 
okay but did your conversion actually reduce because of uh, lower cart to order conversion or is it that actually even before people came to art the uh, the funnel prior to that was breaking so those are the things to keep in mind as you build these hypotheses and want to validate them is this good we can move forward uh, could you explain the percentage uh, that the conversion funnel stands for this one right the first one conversion funnel ha huh, so this and this is the same thing and then this is a breakdown okay, okay. of the same So this okay. is simply to say of hundred people who came on my uh, or thousand people mm -hmm. who came, one thirty eight converted, one thirty eight, and then this is a more detailed breakdown of each leg of that journey. That journey might be across five six uh, steps for your business, so it could be even smaller. Mm. But uh, generally, you will uh, you know you will see some stability in these conversion numbers. So when they deviate, you should probably evaluate. So for example, in this case, home to product page, that mm -hmm. saw like an eight percent dip. so now that could mean that maybe i added so an example here is maybe you added some banner or you know some tile which you thought was great because you thought ki yaar isse to meri information bad rahi hai page ki uh, ya something new is being announced but in reality it might actually have led to a drop off we had to do a lot of experiments in zomato just for this because whether we should have horizontal scrolling or vertical scrolling how big should the tiles be should there be three tiles in the first view or should there be just one large single tile in the first view and then we would compare okay what's the next uh, is the user then taking the next step as much or is is the user not then taking the step because we think that they should but actually data is then proving ki you know less is more for example so those kind of things are the ones that influence home to product pricing and display of pricing is a very big one so for example in the new user case communicating the discount very clearly up front in bold that there is a new user offer especially for you versus keeping it somewhere in low font that had a massive difference in the user conversions so clarity on pricing clarity on product uh, simplicity of ui uh, all of these like became factors so uh, those are the things that will be unique to your product but you you should be on top of them Cool. Um, next thing voice is good yes yeah. one minute oh, sorry what i'm saying is for you know businesses like ours which are you know uh, still in the growth phase or you know we are still right right uh, you know there are not many changes that you make to the website you know like if you look at a zomato or a or a nika they have an entire team you know that you're keeps, right you your know. website may not change but you might actually want to do some experiments to regardless of scale i mean the principle right. still hold you might have a certain type of shopify template that you have used you might want to try another different one at, at least for a short duration to see if any of these conversion metrics improve because trust me like uh, like very very small changes do lead to final changes in conversion regardless of the scale of the brand uh, correct no, no the point that i was trying to make is that you know while i mean obviously it's important to track this but i mean there are obviously more important things like you mentioned the top of uh you know the chart that you gave which i'm not so sure because intuitively we think ki zyada traffic lana chahiye but koi agar dukan pe aa chuka hai to mm -hmm. isn't it more important ki use dukan se check out pe le jao like if you ask a, a, a business owner offline also he'll be like ki jo dukan mein aaya hai pehle to main uski seva karunga so i mean it's somewhat like that yeah so i think jump in ki to just uh, also tracking this is critical because let's say if your payment gateway stops is uh, like fails right and you don't know really why is this all of the following or some page is really not loading for no, you no no what i was trying to say is that tracking it not as frequently as you do the other metric fair so, like probably not like on a daily or a weekly basis but probably i think weekly is bare minimum because you will not know but there will be uh, uh, you know there might be some uh, latency issues that have crept in Hmm. or you know there is some reshuffling of your sku's that happened where some sku went above some sku went below correct correct uh, yeah. because you might be handling it dynamically on the back end basis supply availability so those things will have an influence so at least weekly just to make sure see if it doesn't change it doesn't change it's all yeah. right or if it's getting better it's getting better but uh, there will be instances where there it will change even at a early true true i think yeah that really makes sense Yeah, Ashalin. Uh, so we are ready uh, to send to the our own our mobile app. Uh, we are actually using, and we are using Moengage as a CRM tool, and branch also using. 
So I hope of these mentioned data we can be able to capture through uh, these two tools. Branch, you will be able to find attribution, and then that attribution will help you break down the quality of uh, traffic uh -huh. and conversion. Yes, see, a clever tap will also. Uh, sorry, you said more engage. Yeah, more engage uh, will also capture that data, so you can use more uh, more engage as well. You will have to add the events in more engage, though. Yeah, like, yeah. For example, you will have to add okay, uh, home to product page, product to you know uh, cart page, etc. Those events once you add, you will be able to track them on more engage as well. Okay. Okay. Vishal, uh, there's a question of Sneha. Yeah, yeah, he's Sneha. Hi, Shalin. Uh, what's a good checkout to drop off? Um, uh, sorry, checkout to purchase drop off rate. So again, it will vary very, very significantly basis uh, your category. So if, if it so, was a high ticket item like say a ten thousand rupee bag. In uh, fact, I'm the opposite. So I have a five hundred average value order value. It's average product value is five hundred rupees. It's a kids uh, inner wear. Got it. Right. Sorry, you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So I mean, I can share benchmarks from Zomato just as a high consumer brand, but I don't. I would still say it uh, may not apply. But broadly, forty to fifty percent conversion once someone had finally created a cart, and yeah. about ninety percent conversion once someone had added the payment method. Even there, after payment method, like people would find it slow or buggy, etc. So net net, it would end up being about forty forty five percent. Okay, so what we've been noticing in the past few and months. And not sharing any confidential data here. I just yeah. need to clarify sure. that. Yeah. Sure, sure. What we've been noticing is this rate has been increasing for some reason. Check out to um, purchase drop off for us in the past few months, and we're just wondering why. What could be the possible reasons? So I can uh, help you with two, three of them that yeah. we had solved for. The first one was basically uh, the way you display your pricing, right? So for example. Uh, within that, you might want to te test whether you know hundred rupees plus GST plus delivery or all of it bundled together, and then the user clicks info to figure out whether uh, you know figure out the components. Uh, second one was slash pricing versus discount coupons. So, for example, hundred slashed off to ninety versus hundred, and then some coupon leading to a ten rupee discount or X percentage discount. Which uh, is better? Sorry, which is better in your second example? So we have always found that a coupon works better because the user is more cognitive of the uh, uh, of the benefit that they are getting, okay. and then even within discount, you will uh, have multiple types of what are called discount constructs. So you might have X percentage off or a flat, uh, you know, X rupees off, or you might have a free delivery. Uh, this is the you know, based on the business and category, how much and the unit economics, you would have to figure out which works, which makes sense for you. But generally, percentage off work better for us. Okay. versus flat offs uh, and in percentage offs you could actually control the discount cap while sort of getting a giving a bigger sense of the discount and right? 30% off but up to 75 versus you know versus. 100 100 rupees off and then if those i mean those things you will have to work out based on your category sure uh, so those are some of the main things like uh, delivery time communication uh, yeah. SLA communication, oh, like breach right. of SLA communication, but COD, is COD is like a very huge factor in new users conversion. Like we would see with COD enabled for a lesser price, say minimum hundred rupees, and we'll allow COD versus minimum two hundred rupees, and we'll allow COD. We saw massive uh, differences in the conversion on the cart to uh, checkout page. So, uh, playing around with the minimum order value. So these are some of the levers I've given four five of them. Sure. Uh, so those hopefully should be directional ones that sure. sort of spark Thanks. some additional thoughts. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess we can go to marketing then, Sharon. Yeah. Great, you're on it. So uh, I think someone had asked how do we break that down with this uh, sort of high level marketing view into campaigns and cha channels and campaigns. So two hierarchies, right? Channels or networks is basically Google versus Facebook versus everything else. And campaigns is with, see, if I'm just doing Facebook, then I have five campaigns running, then would want to measure the performance of each, right? So I've just kept given a high level of sort of uh, template here. And have you on the right? Uh, marketing, huh? Okay. Cool. So I've just given a high level overview here. And you can obviously plug it in basis the kind of networks that you're using. So table eight is more about networks uh, like Facebook and search and uh, you know GD and YouTube. So the higher, higher, the bigger branch. And then the next table is like a sub branch. So in this particular uh, issue of 10% degrowth, basically what we are seeing is that 
uh, on YouTube, there is good news. It seems that either organically uh, or whether it's a paid ad, we are seeing more traffic through uh, more eyeballs on YouTube. Or maybe the CPM is lower for YouTube, but uh, YouTube is good. But I'm seeing a drop off in my uh, click through rates on uh, overall click through rates. So most of the uh, degrowth is because of click through rates, and those click through rates have specifically gone down significantly on Facebook. So that sort of uh, then gives me a sense of okay, we are saying creatives are not working, but creatives are actually not working just on the Facebook Insta part of it. Maybe they are actually working on uh, most of the others. And even within Facebook and Instagram, Instagram is not as bad. Maybe uh, because there are different types of assets that you can use for each. I, you might want to just figure out the assets that you're specifically using for Facebook, and that that helps you debug the issue better. Again, I would strongly urge doing lots of uh, copy testing here, uh, creative testing. Intuitively, uh, even in Zomato, we would go from one end of the spectrum, which was like just out and out, very uh, creative, like we are on the social channel, even for our paid ads, like on social, you would see on Twitter, we write a lot of quirky content, right? And so one would wonder why, why not apply the same strategy for paid ads? So the Instagram paid ad that I'm running, why not show the quirky content that I'm showing on social or something related to that? Uh, honestly, it never worked. We tried it, but it never worked. And so uh, in paid marketing, especially what worked best was communicate one key benefit and communicate the price. I think these were the two things that always work. How we, we tried to do something very creative and very fancy. It cost us a lot of money. We probably applauded ourselves and patted ourselves on the back saying Ki yaar, badia branding kiya hai. But if it's something that is supposed to bring you conversion and it's not doing that, then you better sort of revisit your options. Uh, so it's in our case, simple biryani with like at 149 and a you know great looking biryani was generally good enough. And I've had, we've tested agnostic thousands of creatives, but generally that still ends up being the thing. But the point is test multiple creatives, have a hypothesis, go in with some intuition, but sort of validate that. Salim, a quick question. Uh, post the iOS changes in um, Facebook, have you seen any differences in attribution and what are some of the things that uh, you've seen kind of helping in better attribution to campaigns, etc.? So I guess the biggest impact Facebook has, I mean, first of all, iOS users in India are less. So that, that's so far good news because Google has not really uh, uh, announced anything on the privacy front. So as much as there's a lot of noise in the US about uh, iOS 14 in India, the impact is slightly less subdued. Even within that, typically the impact is generally either on repeat user re-engagement because you don't have, uh, you know, you don't have the IDFA device IDs or it is on uh, abandonment related sort of follow-ups, right? So if someone uh, added to cart but dropped off and now I want to chase him back, now if I don't have the device ID, then that becomes an issue. So those are the two main fronts where uh, you can face an issue. So if you are deeply into iOS users and within that, if your uh, business is very critically dependent on either repeat users on chasing or chasing abandoned users, the users who have abandoned you at any point in the funnel, then those are the two cases where I would see a deeper impact. In Mato's case, there wasn't a huge dependency on either of these two, plus abandonment related uh, problem was solved because we would use uh, notifications or emails to chase the users back. Plus we had a very short window that like you have to convince a user to order food in an hour if they want to, otherwise they'll sort of forget you and all, figure out a solution. So following up and abandonment is a big use case in high ticket purchase items. Like if I'm say planning travel and if, if I'm looking at a location, then make my trip will generally follow up with me multiple times because they know the purchase decision is long. If the purchase decision is short, again, I, I would see that there would be lesser impact. So lastly, lesser impact if you are hedged more on the Google side versus Facebook, and if Facebook is not very, very core to your offering. Facebook ads. Okay. Uh, yeah, so table nine is just a breakdown at a campaign level, and then we can move to so table 10 is basically uh, looking at the same thing, but from a CPM point of view. So the previous one was more on how my ads performed in terms of click through rate. The second one is how expensive is the inventory from a cost per impression point of view. And so no, having a handle on both is critical. Sometimes your ads might be good, but as someone mentioned that, you know, it's an issue of inflated CPM. CPMs are inflated because of IPL season. 
uh, again, you might want to validate it. It might be possible that despite IPL for your category or, or in general, CPMs have not really fluctuated very significantly. Then again, you, you will want to find other reasons why your campaigns have performed more poorly. Right, and the last bit is basically uh, user growth accounting. Thoda se zoom kar dogi kya, uh, Sharad? I think yeah. you can just focus on that. Uh, yeah. Ali, uh, quick question. So, uh, in the source, you mentioned only Facebook and uh, uh, like Facebook slash Google Ads and Google Analytics. Are these the only two sources you use? And, and the reason I'm asking is because Shopify would obviously be one other or whatever uh, you have created uh, for you created a website with. And if you've created it from scratch, then you would likely have a database as well. So probably something like a MySQL or a Postgres or uh, other such databases, which can, which sort of hold your internal data. Those would be the additional data sources. Okay. The reason I was asking was because, I mean, if you, if you send a user to a different landing page, let's say a collection page, and then they go to a product page and eventually purchase mm -hmm. the UTM, the UTM would get lost, right? Because you are sending it to the land, uh, collection page and Google analytics would not be able to track no, no, it. Google because... would, uh... Google Analytics would give you aggregate level data, individual date level data you can get through something like Mix Panel. So okay. you, you should uh, check it out. I'll just drop it in. Mix Panel, I'll just put it on the chat. But it's like one of the common ones used for broader clients. They will have some free versions there. I think that should help. Sir. Okay. I'll take a look at it. Thanks. Yeah, so we were on user growth accounting. Uh, now, the idea uh, behind this section sort of was the when you look at the business performance or your marketing spends, uh, one very high level way to look at it is key, here is my CAC and here are my new users, right? Okay, so I have a hundred new users and I spent say a hundred dollars against them. So one dollar is my CAC. But generally it is better to have a decoupled view basis, you know, uh, basis the performance marketing and the discount marketing, right? So of hundred dollars, you might have spent say sixty, seventy dollars on performance marketing, which is ads on uh, different platforms, and you might have spent some amounts on discounts, say thirty dollars for uh, discounting, new giving discounts or incentives to new users. Now knowing the CAC for each of these is super helpful separately, because then that can give you a sense of you know is is it better that I spend a hundred dollars on discounts or is it better that I spend a hundred dollars purely on uh, ads? And I know that some of us may also hesitate to have any sort of an incentive saying that it dilutes the brand. It's a fair thought, but I would again, urge you all to validate it by doing some tests uh, on the pricing and discount side. Uh, because yes, if you very, if you very steeply discount your product at 70, 80%, et cetera, you will surely see that the subsequent retentions are going to be low for those cohorts. Uh, so uh, if you give a 70, 80% discount and that's the only thing you're doing, all of your basically spends are discount spend. So your CAC needs to be, a bit, all of your CAC is basically paid CAC is coming from discounts. So break it down into, uh, you know, uh, top of funnel CAC and sort of bottom of funnel CAC and ma make sure that you from, from on, your, on your own business, you know how they, how healthy or what's the relationship between them. So for example, in this, in this one, uh, my CAC on performance marketing is one four four eight five. So I'm spending 1500 bucks or, uh, in converting a user just through a Facebook CAC. If, whereas if I want, if instead of that, I had the lens of getting more conversion instead of getting more traffic, I would realize that maybe my discount CAC was, uh, discount CAC was something I could play with at a lesser cost, I might be able to convert the user. Sorry, in this example, ulta hai waise, but it will be unique for your business. In this example, discount marketing ka CAC zada hai or performance marketing ka CAC kam. It could be the other way around as well. So again, you should sort of know, uh, know uh, uh, no, uh, no, when, which one do you want to dial up, dial down, and what mix you want to keep in terms of spends between these two? Yeah, so, so, Shalin, uh, so how this discount marketing is applying on a new customer? How is discount marketing applying on a new customer? Discount marketing is basically your, uh, the way to think about it is if I had, so the, so the way to think about it is if I had uh, no discounts, some users would still convert. So say uh, uh, hundred users came to the website and 20 of them converted. 
so 20 new users i got i acquired at zero rupees now say i run a hundred rupee off coupon so because of the hundred rupee off coupon basically hundred into i run ran a hundred rupee coupon and i got say 120 so now i'm spending hundred into 120 so i've spent a total of 12000 rupees and in the process of whatever i got i've got 20 extra customers Okay, okay. So my so cost discount... per extra user is six hundred rupees. Now, does does it make sense or does it not make sense spending six hundred rupees for an extra customer? Obviously, that's a call you would take. But the way you should look at it is without any uh, without any discount. In the base case, how many users I would get, and with okay. a discount, how many? Users. Okay, so discount marketing will be a combination of uh, discount that giving to the new customer along with the performance marketing cost. I couldn't catch that, but I. The point I was trying to make here is what is your base case without any spends and what is your, uh, you know, what is your base case with some spends and then see the delta between both and uh, then take a call. So I've okay. given actually an example here that will make it a bit more clear. Maybe you can look at it here. So I've called it cost per incremental order. If you go, uh, go, go lower. Yeah, that cost per incremental uh, order. So uh, because we're short of time, so but we've covered it in the table. So uh, with discounts, without discounts, and how much I, how much extra I got, and therefore my cost per incremental order. This will give a sense of my efficiency of marketing okay. sense. So uh, this template will be shared. So uh, I know we have had to rush through a few things, but hopefully, if I were to sort of summarize. Uh, maybe I can take the screen back again if it works. Just one sec. I'll take the screen back again. Yeah, this I, I think you should be able to see. Yeah, you can. Okay. How do I remember all this, right? I mean, obviously the sheet, etc., will be shared, but if you were looking for a quick hacky way to remember it, we're calling it the growth farm model. That's basically just an acronym for thinking about your business from these four dimensions. Like, is it a frequency problem? Is it an acquisition problem? Is it a retention problem? Or is it a monetization problem? And broadly, all of the input factors that we had discussed, you will be able to bucket it into any of these. So for example, if AUV dropped, essentially it's a monetization problem. If my uh, support fulfillment was not good, then it's it's going to show up in retention. It will likely not show up in acquisition because I had a poor experience that repeat that customer is not going to repeat with me, and therefore my retention is going to be lower uh, because that user is going to completely churn out. If it's something related to marketing spends, and most of the time marketing spends are on new customers, then it's going to be in acquisition. So all of those fifty things that we had listed down, invariably you will be able to. Uh, Sort of track them against any of these. If I were to break down output metrics into these four buckets and track my input metrics, it just becomes a bit more efficient. Makes sense. Yes, I just want to make sure everyone, anyways, you will get those videos and these slides to sort of watch again. But <laughs> so I don't know if we have enough time for questions, but I've tried to take them through the discussion. But uh, anything else that you guys would want covered? Any any last uh, question anyone wants to raise? Or we are good? Uh, I know there's a lot to capture in this session, but I want to check in. Okay, I think we are good. All right. So I think a couple of folks had DM'd me on my contacts. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, drop in my LinkedIn here and my WhatsApp so that it's easier for you all to connect uh, for for any specific i think if it will be good if there are any follow up questions we can cluster them together sharan yeah, so, yeah. so, so Shalom, what we do is anyways uh, so there's a good incentive for them to give you feedback everyone in their session so when you will get a feedback form there's a way what you would like to ask Shalin. just fill that up. And all the details we will share with Shalin together so that will just be easiest yeah, I've just shared my LinkedIn, so I would love to connect with all. So uh, let's definitely be on touch there, uh, in on in touch there, and uh, uh, we're soon to launch our product. So I will also try to find some of you and take some early feedback. Some of you had also DM'd me saying, "When does the product launch, and can it start helping us?" 
so just do drop in a LinkedIn to me and we'll set something up that uh, we can take forward. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, so two of the things I just want to summarize. Thank you, Shalin, for doing this. Uh, whenever we do the session, Shalin, we never have enough time. Uh, and that is because he's such an expert in covering such a very advanced and deep topic. And to be honest, we've been iterating and working on it to making it simpler every time. And I'm, I feel this time we did a great job in sort of delivering a lot of those insights. Uh, anyways, you'll get those slides, you'll get those videos, you'll get those worksheets. Uh, but the sort of two, three things I want to highlight is, I hope after the session, right, we sort of break them down and understood what are those key input factors which are sort of driving in our business. Growth is all learned by experimentation. Uh, but before experimentation, you should be able to track whatever experiments you're running to see if they ended up returning something for you or not. Uh, I also want to highlight Shalin is an expert to a masterclass in like sort of pricing and discounting. Whenever I talk to him, he said I could do a separate session on that. <laughs> but uh, you know, like because they've done hundreds of experiments on the matter in terms of right, like should I do slash based discounting, should I do rupees based discounting, should I do percentage based discounting? Uh, and I and today's sort of session really showed that. Uh, so on that note, uh, Shalin, thank you so much for doing this. I want to sort of you know, play a little background music. I know we're kind of in the board, but everyone unmute yourself, turn on your, turn on your videos, and uh, it's our way of saying thanks to Shalin again. Uh, Shalin, you can join us. Put your hands together. Videos on, unmuted, yeah? Ready? Three, two, five. Okay. 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 Ok